For 150 years, the Chantry Ireland Lighthouse has been a beacon of hope. Safeguarding sailors and their ships from Lake Huron's wrath. <laughs> ah, those limestone walls hold many a secret. The old lighthouse has guided generations of mariners and stood the test of time. And the lighthouse still stands tall and proud. But it was more than just a light. It's, it symbolized a, a way of life, a, a time of honor gone by and, and now forgotten. This lighthouse, this island, was home to my family and to my son's family and to the families of all the other lighthouse keepers who followed us. Day and night we worked to protect the mariners who connected the small community of Southampton with other ports along Lake Huron and beyond. Oh, we had some good times. And yet, I also remember the tragedies, all of them, and all of the lives lost around this wee island. And my soul grows weak to think that no one has cared enough to keep our spirits alive. We're lost deep beneath the waters, just like the skeletons of once magnificent ships that lie scattered on Lake Huron's cold floor. Passing time, the past is yours and mine. Tell those yet to come, we were here. Let me take you back to the beginning. By the 1840s, the area known as the Queen's Bush was the last unsettled region in what would become Southern Ontario. And when the colonial government announced the availability of land in this region, prospective settlers arrived by the hundreds. There were no railways, so the tall ships and schooners carrying supplies, mail and passengers were the lifeline to the outside world. They sailed with a compass and memories of other journeys. The maps and charts that did exist were vague, and in some cases, fraught with error. It was hard work. Uh, the pay was a dollar a day, and uh, it was risky business, and uh, you were expected to work all hours the night and day if you had to change sails, and they would call you out of your bunk to come up and, and uh, work on changing sails. Several communities sprung up along the Huron shore. But only a few would prosper. Saugeen was blessed with a fine natural harbor, the key to success of any aspiring coastal community. In 1858, the community changed its name to Southampton after the great British port. These small towns along the lakefront, they relied on lake shipping to establish that link with other businesses and other, in other cities to bring merchandise to the hardware stores and the finished products, cast iron stoves, and they would export their crops. Soon, ships were carrying passengers and cargo up and down Lake Huron day and night. As shipping traffic increased, so too did the number of maritime accidents. The routine journeys could quickly turn to terror. Imagine being out on a lake and the barometer drops and the wind picks up and the currents start to pull the ship. The only light on the coastline was a flash of lightning. Even the best captain struggled to stay alive when faced with Huron's fury. 
In response to the growing number of maritime casualties, the largest lighthouse project to that date was initiated in 1855. Eleven Imperial Tower lighthouses were planned. However, only six would be completed. To light the passage into Southampton Harbour, the construction of Chantry Island Lighthouse began in 1855. Now, shipping the Dolomite limestone, which was cut 20 miles south of here at Inverhuron, was in itself a major accomplishment. Now, the rock was shipped up the coastline, and sometimes the sheer weight of the stone would sink the load to the bottom of the lake. The lighthouse is an amazing structure. It is to Southampton and Saugeen Shores as the pyramids are to Egypt. It was built and completed by this famous stonemason, John Brown, who got two international awards for his work. It's seven and a half feet thick at the base, 73 feet around, 86 feet to the center of the light. It acts as, if, if you look at the design, it acts as a chimney and it exhausts all moisture. So its structure was intact and, and, and very much, almost perfect. Despite the early start, the Chantry Island Lighthouse was not completed until 1858, when the light was delivered and the unassembled lantern room was completed. From the gallery on up was all built in France by a company in Paris because the lenses were called Fresnel lenses and they were the, the um, Fresnel was a French physicist who invented those lenses. They're very, very uh, elegant lenses, and uh, the original was one anyway. It weighed 10,000 pounds, and um, the whole idea there, it, it dealt with light as a wave. Up till Fresnel and a guy named Young, people thought that, that uh, light was corpuscles moving through a thing called the ether, because that's what Newton thought. They proved that light somehow exhibits wave properties and those lenses exploit the wave property of light by taking the amplitudes, the, taking the peaks and pushing them higher and taking the valleys and taking whatever light is in the valleys and shoving it into the peaks and projecting it out. So this light could be seen from for 20-25 miles. Now, these new lighthouses needed keepers and when I saw the job posting I decided to submit my name. Well, I, I've enjoyed working on and off the water, but this would allow me to live by the water and by my family. And my wife Louisa would be happy to have me near to home for a change. On April the 1st, 1858, I got the notice that I had been awarded the job of lighthouse keeper on Chantry Island. The pay was $435 a year. My name is Captain Lambert and I keep the chantry light. I climb the winding staircase through the day and through the night. We live alone, but that's okay, there's plenty to be done. And once a month we go ashore and visit everyone. At 47 years of age, I took upon my post. We viewed it as our family's job to watch the shore and coast. As time went by, our home became a visitor's delight. Beginning in the 1870s and going up through the 1920s, the shipping on the Great Lakes was at its absolute heyday. There were thousands of vessels of, from, of all shapes and sizes, from little tugboats and fishing schooners right up to Great Lakes freighters that uh, were 300, 400, and after the turn of the century, 600 feet long. But if you're out in the open lake, um, the wind isn't blowing that strong. You'd like to get from Tobermory down to Godreach. So you're sailing along and all of a sudden the wind speed starts to increase and the barometer begins to drop. And if the wind speed hits 60 miles an hour, you're looking at waves that are running 15 to 20 feet in height the waves start to climb aboard the boat and smash things. So under these circumstances, these schooners would come ashore quite often driven up onto the beach or into a shoal area where they were smashed to pieces. 
and the crew were forced to get off in the all boat if they still had one. And then they'd try to make their way through the breakers up onto the beach. Very treacherous because in many, many uh, instances, the, the all boat was overturned and the crew were pitched into the, the surf and where they were drowned or they would drag, their, drag themselves ashore and um, die of hypothermia unless somebody came along and found them. With the large number of maritime accidents and the relentless fury of Lake Huron, a discussion began in the Dominion on the need for a safe haven or harbor of refuge. Many small communities submitted proposals declaring why they would be best suited for a harbor of refuge. Southampton's Chantry Island was awarded this important title in 1870. So they started building these timber cribs that were 30 feet square. And when the crib was, the crib had a floor uh, near the bottom, not quite at the bottom, but near the bottom. And they were all built out of square timbers that were about 12 inches by 12 inches square. And they would float this crib out into position and then fill it full of rock. So these cribs extended right up above the water and gradually, bit by bit, they built this long dock that went from the north end of Chantry Island um, out to a point about halfway across between, from Chantry Island to the mainland. And it went in an arc. And eventually there was only a gap about 400 feet in the middle going all the way from the island to the mainland. And it was intended that in the event of a storm, that the ships would be able to go into this harbor of refuge to seek shelter. The harbor of refuge was completed by 1877 at a cost of $300,000. It was the largest public works project for that time and an incredible accomplishment. At the same time, I continued to build a life here. Louisa and I enjoyed life on the island with our family. Well, I fished and mended nets for extra income, and built an addition on the keeper's home. <laughs> I even cleared the field on the rocky soil and brought over my cow daisy <laughs> during the warmer months. And he cleared a pasture, which was amazing actually, because Chantry Island is, is uh, kind of rocky. And, uh, but anyway, he cleared some kind of a pasture and he would bring his cow over. You may wonder how a cow gets over to the island. Uh, he would bring the cow over while the ice was still in the bay. Uh, early in the spring, he would drive the cow, Daisy, drive Daisy over to the, to the uh, uh, chantry. And Daisy would stay there all summer grazing on the pasture land. Well, the story goes that one of the workers on the long dock uh, had a cow and said, well, I'll take my cow over and the cow can graze there too. So Duncan McGregor said, oh no, this is my pasture. You can't have your cow here. And Daisy doesn't want any strange cows lurking around. So uh, there was a, a dispute and the dispute, we know that this dispute exists because uh, Duncan McGregor wrote letter after letter to, to the bureaucrats and to the various authorities saying that this was his pasture and he didn't want this other cow on it. And uh, he got the usual bureaucratic runaround. Marvelous letters that he wrote, beautifully written with, with lovely penmanship and, and really expressed himself well. And, and kept getting uh, shunted off to some other bureaucrat. And finally, however, he won. Persistence paid off, and uh, the pasture was for Daisy only. <laughs> our health to us was in our food and everything we drank. To have the strength to save those lives as many schooners sank. Louisa bought a dairy cow to give us milk and cheese. We lived out in the pasture there among the many trees. All I knew was that Captain Lambert was a very strong, I guess, powerful person, and he was very definitely the patriarch in, in that family, and everybody bowed to his wishes. 
My children grew up on the water, so it was no surprise to anyone that they would answer its call. Roland and William left to join the ships, and Ross stayed and became an able assistant. Yes, able and with courage ever challenging the great Lake Huron. But, as was all too familiar to us, the lake would have the last word. William was carving out a, a life for himself that had nothing to do with Chantry Island, and then something happened. And the something that happened was a tragedy because his brother and, and one of the sons of Duncan McGregor Lambert drowned trying to rescue some sailors off uh, Chantry Island. This, was a, this affected the father greatly, Duncan McGregor. He was completely distraught, and he, he gave up being the lighthouse keeper at that point. I couldn't take any more after losing my son. In 1880, I retired after 22 years on the island. But maybe I didn't leave soon enough. Three years later, in 1883, my life quietly came to an end. Now, William, aside from, I think, having this adventurous spirit of his, he also had a tremendous sense of duty. Duty was important. And his father couldn't carry on, so he would carry on. So back he came to uh, Southampton, out to the island, and he became the second lighthouse keeper. And that sense of duty uh, I, I see in his life. Uh, he, he would do what had to be done. And, and unfortunately, uh, one of the things that had to be done was there were ships being wrecked constantly all around Chantry Island. Chantry Island is, is really a, a reef or a shoal I guess it's an old moraine from the glacier that, that lurks under uh, the, the surface of Lake Huron for quite a ways and then just emerges briefly for, for while it's Chantry Island and then goes back lurking under the surface again. And ships were forever running into that. It was very dangerous. In fact, they call it the Lambert Shoals after Lambert to this day. And, and of course, that was the reason for the lighthouse in the first place. So even though the lighthouse was there and, and mariners would know not to, to approach too closely because of the danger, uh, the storms that would come up on Lake Huron, they were fierce storms and, and uh, the ships would be tossed about and they would go there whether their captain wanted them to or not. So there were a lot of shipwrecks still, even with the lighthouse, a lot of shipwrecks around Chantry Island. And of course when that happened, uh, William McGregor had this terrific sense of duty and he would do everything in his power to save the mariners uh, who, were, who were being shipwrecked. And so there are many, many stories of, of his going out and rescuing uh, people. Uh, he received medals and, and all sorts of honor and recognition. He, he basically was the most famous lighthouse keeper on Chantry. There were quite a few lighthouse keepers and not taking anything away from the, from the others, but uh, I guess just maybe the combination of the time that he was there and, and the ships that were, were plying the waters, uh, he, he did a lot of life-saving uh, missions from, from the island and, uh, and was a hero to many people. William strove to make Chantry Island an idyllic place to live. He added to the landscape by planting fruit trees and shrubs. He built a quarter mile long boardwalk between the lighthouse to the long dock. Chantry Island became a popular picnicking area and people came to the island by the boatload. William understood the water and the weather. Lake Huron was like an old friend who sometimes turned sour for no apparent reason. And when that anger rose up to wreak havoc on ships and sailors, William dared to challenge that old friend. On September the 1st, 1892, the schooner Nettie Woodward 
carrying lumber to markets in the United States, suddenly felt this wrath when struck by a sudden and violent storm. The netty woodward struck a reef, a lion in her way. Brave lads, cried Captain Cowell, I do think it's time to pray. So they knew that their uh, chances of survival are, are limited and uh, they would be, I would imagine they'd be terrified for their lives. They really would. It's light shone o'er the water, help us now is its request. And they spent the whole night in pitch darkness up there on, in the rigging with no lanterns or anything, just hanging on and talking to each other, trying to stay alive. There are sailor lads a drowning, you must rescue them tonight. So as the ship went down, the crew uh, climbed up the rigging into the cross trees. Oh, Janet, dearest Janet, in truth you see a light. There are sailor lads a drowning, I must rescue them tonight. Unfortunately, one of the crewmen had died uh, from exposure in the arms of the captain up in the rigging. Young Nelson Mahoney was only 16 years, but he drowned in the captain's arms. Oh, bitter were our tears. Dora Lee, a laddie. Dora and uh, he knew the ship was going to go down, so he got on a hatch and rode the hatch into the harbor. And there was quite a few ships tied up along the dock. And he yelled, help, help, I need your help. But they just thought he was some young kid, drunked up from town, having fun, didn't do anything about it. And he died of exposure on the beach in his own hometown. Just wasn't fair. And four months, I think it was after that, four or five months after that, his son was born. He was my father. First mate Joseph Greathead, he tried to make the shore, but he drowned in the black water and it grieved our hearts full sore. Dora Lee, a laddie, Dora Lee, my lily -o. Here's to Captain Lambert, cried Cowell and his crew. Here's to Captain Lambert, he's the one who pulled us through. Dora Lee, a laddie, Dora Lee, my lily -o. For my son's heroic act, he was presented a gold watch from the Government of Canada. The inscription read, Presented by the Government of Canada to William McGregor Lambert in recognition of his humane, gallant exertions in saving life on Lake Huron, Ontario, 1st of September, 1892, and other occasions. William Lambert and his father, Duncan Lambert, they seemed to have a a sixth sense there was something wrong out there, that there was a wreck and people were in trouble. I'm so proud of William and all of my children. <laughs> the circle of life continued on Chantry, with William raising his own family on the island. But it wasn't all work. Uh, there was a social time too. Uh, Southampton was a big port, very important port. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, people coming and going, a lot of sailors who would come in and then go out, and come in and go out. So there's that, that constant uh, uh, influx of sailors in for a few nights and then out. And uh, Captain Lambert knew a lot of them. And so if they arrived, sometimes they were invited out to the lighthouse and they would spend the evening. So there'd be a lot of catching up of news because uh, sailors from, from other ports and other towns would be arriving and they could bring you up to date to what was happening down there in Goderich, you know. <laughs> uh, we have a, a, a diary that was written in 1896, 1896, amazing. And it was written by uh, Robert Whiteman 
And he and two other young men, they were just in their 20s, and they uh, had this great idea in 1896 of uh, cycling through southwestern Ontario. They started out from Toronto. And, and one of the places that they went to was Chantry Island. And they kept a, a really good diary of what happened. So by reading through that diary, I got a real feel for, for what life must have been like on the island at that time. It was nearly nine when we arose, and it is customary to leave by 10 for church. For this and other reasons, we prepared at once for church and started off almost immediately after breakfast. It was my first experience of sailing to church and also of an English church service. Coming home, the wind was right ahead, so Jim and I pulled at the oars. It was nearly two when we reached the island and consequently about three when dinner was called. Spent evening about the island and after supper, about nine o'clock, sang hymns until nearly 11. Then after worship, turned in. And there was even a little romance. I think they had a, an ulterior motive because uh, one, of the, one, of the three, one of the three young men was a fellow by the name of Jim Beach. And for some reason or other, which I haven't quite figured out how he would get to know her, but he, he knew the lighthouse keeper's daughter. That would be Captain Lambert's daughter, whose name was Ellen. <coughs> Pardon me, Ellen. Uh, he knew her and, and uh, the two of them were interested in each other. It was a stretch of my imagination to actually be in the house and try to visualize how these uh, things could have been when my grandmother was a young girl and my grandfather was courting her and, and so on. I knew very little about life on, uh, on the island. Now, I always assumed the lighthouse keeper was the one who would go trundling up those stairs in the, in the uh, lighthouse and, and light the big lamp at the top. Uh, but often it turned out to be the uh, Mrs. Lambert and, and the daughters. They were the ones who trooped up the lighthouse. Of course, the young lads went up there too and the young girls were going up. <laughs> uh, but the reason for that actually was not, not so, uh, so sexist as it may seem, but uh, Captain Lambert had to light the range lamp, and the range lamp was on the end of the long dock, the island side of the long dock. When I was talking earlier about uh, these, these three young lads who cycled to, to uh, Chantry, and they had, ul I think, ulterior motives, and it was interesting, two of them married uh, lighthouse keeper's daughters, and uh, the third one, the fellow who actually wrote the diary, he married the sister of, of Jim Bache, who married Ellen Lambert, who were my wife's grandparents. They had uh, four children. The four of them uh, were christened on Chantry Island. They were christened on Chantry Island. I think it's such a wonderful tale. I, I can, I can sort of picture it in my mind, the family assembling in Southampton and somehow getting transported over by boat to the island, all the guests coming, the various relatives, the maiden aunts, all this kind of thing, the rector from the, the Anglican church, everybody showing up, uh, William uh, McGregor being the center of attention even on a baby's christening, I'm sure, because he had that kind of personality. and. Uh, there are pictures, we have pictures of, of, the, of the children there and, and uh, for one of the christening ceremonies. And I just think it's so wonderful. It, it meant, it, it tells me how important that island was to them. I mean, they could be christened anywhere or in church or, or whatever, but no, they went out to the island and all four of them were christened on Chantry Island. We have the, uh, in our house, we have the cradle that those four children were in and uh, our grandchildren have been in it. So that's five generations, if I'm counting right, using that cradle. Uh, we have the christening robe. We have the christening robe that was actually used on Chantry Island. So it is, it's a wonderful story, isn't it, when you think about it, these children being christened one after another out on Chantry. <laughs> it has always been a special place for me, but 
sort of receded in the background because I was never able to be uh, out there. But now I look forward to taking my grandsons out there and letting them see a little bit of this. And both my daughters who have never been able to be on the island but have been in Southampton would like to go and climb the lighthouse stairs and see what it was like for their ancestors. So it will follow our, uh, our family. I think that roots are such an important thing. Uh, it's, it's, what, it's, it's, it's the one thing that each one of us has is our own roots and, and that's what uh, we build our life on, you know. And so it, it's just, it's something that's very important to me. I think that having the roots and being able to look back helps me to look forward and uh, tell me where I'm going. It seems that some of that Lambert spirit does live on. Uh, it's nice to be remembered. But what about all of the others? What of them? And who is honoring all those souls lost at sea? When I went out to Chantry Island for the very first time in 1985, I felt sad. It, Chantry Island has been part of my growing up the years and my grandmother talked about it and so did my mother. So it was very sad to see it just left in disarray. My father was the lighthouse keeper there. Uh, he uh, went on as a lighthouse keeper in 1937. My son-in-law took us out about four or five years ago and it was really, well, maybe longer than that, but it was awful to see that they had just left that house go. Well, by that time the roof was gone, everything was down in the basement and the lighthouse, they had uh, boarded up all the windows and they tried to keep it locked but we didn't break in now because somebody else had broken in and we walked up to the lighthouse. Oh, it was so filthy and we walked up to the top and then back down again. I just wanted to do it, <laughs> see what it was like. But it was kind of heartbreaking to see it all just got left to rack and ruin. Jean and I would stand on the shore and we'd gaze out at the island and we'd say, that's our lighthouse, <laughs> even though it isn't. Uh, but we felt that way. Uh, but it, it just seemed unattainable somehow. Uh, but in 1985, I think they were thinking about, in, in Southampton, they were thinking about ways of fixing up the lighthouse. And uh, we hitched a ride out with uh, some people who were looking at it uh, to see if some kind of something might happen and and we landed on the on the shore of Chantry Island it was like landing on hallowed ground you know for me and it's a kind of rocky shore there were no docks so getting there was not easy um, and and there was the lighthouse standing there looking up I mean it was terrific and there was the keeper's house now the keeper's house oh dear uh, from from the from the uh, distance we didn't notice this, but when you're up close, the roof was gone, there was no roof on it, the windows were all broken, there were no floors, it was just really the shell of it. And, and the slate, it was a slate roof and the slates were just lying higgledy-piggledy all about. There was stuff there, it was, it was a mess. And it was sad. Here I was, I was so excited, I'd landed on Chantry, I was on hallowed ground looking at the lighthouse and it was, it, I just felt sad. The lighthouse, of course, was locked because it was still operating and, and the, whoever is responsible for that, you know, didn't want people getting in there. And, and the house was, was completely derelict. So I took a lot of pictures and we walked around and said, this is wonderful, we're on Chantry, but gosh, it looks terrible. And, and, and you know, it, it looked forlorn. That's what it looked like. It looked like nobody cared for it. And uh, we went back and, and we said, well, <laughs> there's our lighthouse, but I wonder if anybody really cares about this thing. About five or six years ago, the town hired David Douglas. He's a professor from Guelph University, and he belonged to uh, the, uh, what was it, Municipal and Rural Affairs in, at the university, and he would go around talking to various communities about 
what they wanted their community to look like ten years from now. And uh, so I was involved with that. And from that, the, the people that came to those meetings, up to 60 and 70 people sometimes, they decided that uh, if we're going to do something in Southampton to encourage the growth of the community and, and to encourage, uh, you know, summer trade and business and so on, a lot of our other businesses had disappeared. So he's, we decided then and there that uh, we needed something that would be, uh, that would be useful in all advertisements. And we decided that the island and the lighthouse itself was it. The Propeller Club and the Marine Heritage Society took over the Chantry Island restoration, not knowing what we were doing, but thinking it was worthwhile anyways. Lighthouses are, are unique, I think, among the structures that, that we build in our world. They're built uh, for a purpose. They're built to guide. They're built for safety. They're, they're a refuge. Uh, I can think of mariners out on the ocean or on the lakes or whatever and, and they finally see the welcoming light of, of a lighthouse and it just means so much to them that, that lighthouses somehow carry a huge symbolic significance that even landlubbers who've never been to sea in their life uh, recognize that kind of thing that the beacon of the lighthouse shining out in, in the darkness you know is, is hugely symbolic and that lighthouse is, it happens to be very attractive. The Imperial Lighthouse is a really classic lighthouse design out there on an island that, that it looks like you could just reach out and touch it or you could swim out to it or something, but actually you can't. It's just sort of tantalizingly beyond your, your grasp. And, and there it is. And, and I think it's, it's in people when they, when they look at that lighthouse that all sorts of things are there. And when this project got started, I, I think at that point there was probably no stopping them. When we first started the project, we got one of our friends who's an eminent architect over to look at it. He kind of shook his head. First of all, it's a long way offshore. And if you don't bring something from shore, you're not going to go back and get it that easy. And he said, well, you can do it, but it would cost a uh, between 800000 and a million dollars to do. And we looked at it and we said, well, we can't, obviously can't afford that, so we've got to find ways to do it. Early on, the skepticism was, was high, and uh, we just failed to pay attention to that. Floors were all in the basement. Yeah, everything was in the basement. The roof, the second floor, there's maybe four boards left or eight. The first floor was completely gone. It was all in the basement. The stairwell was in the basement, you know, and it had rotted completely. All that was left was compost. Of course, it took 40 years for that to happen, almost 40 years. In order to get that material out of there, uh, we thought of having some kind of a, something that would carry it up on a, on a long traveler. We couldn't get one small enough, so we said, well, I guess we're going to have to take it out in different ways. So we decided on buckets, you know, five-gallon pails, and we'd shove it out the window area. It was a monumental job. I figure it was close to 50 tons of debris in that basement, 50 tons of it. And, oh, that took, that took a year and a half to get all that out. In the middle of the room, we came across a huge stone. And we discovered from Art Nectel and other people who had spent their, uh, some, some part of their life out there, uh, their father was a lighthouse keeper, that this stone was used to keep all their perishables. It was huge. It's almost as big as this table. And uh, it was about six inches off the floor. And uh, they put their butter and their cheese and their eggs and their milk down there and keep it cool. <laughs> and and I, I, it's amazing how they cleaned out the basement and found that rock that we used as our... Uh, fridge or ice box. We had to carry our stuff down every day. It was right, it's right in the ground and it's wet and cold and it kept kept milk and everything. We came over, I came over one time when I, well, I'd be, I was 10, I'd be 11 or 12, be 11 I guess, because we went over the first summer when I was 10. Art 
being a baby and he had to have milk and we got storm stayed for a couple days we couldn't get home and we had the we were old enough we could get along without milk but not art we dad came over and the the, the docks were all there, the short dock, the long dock, the island dock. But the, it was still so bad that he couldn't dock the boat. And he got as close to the dock as he could, and I jumped off and went and got milk. Came back down to the dock, and he got close again, and I jumped back on the boat. <laughs> Imagine having enough nerve to do that. <laughs> I decided to become involved, I guess, because my father had been involved with a little bit of the marine heritage of Southampton. And, uh, we were fortunate out here on this farm in that we have a, a huge 45-acre bush. And in it, there were a lot of hemlock trees, some of them over 200 years old, and uh, we needed a lot of wood out there. And it was going to be a little bit too difficult to get this nominal sizes that we needed, like 3 by 12 by 24s and uh, 3 by 6 by uh, 20 for roof rafters. And so I said, well, I know what we can do. We can cut the timber out of our bush and get it milled right there. It didn't take long to do the milling, maybe four days total. But getting the wood, getting it, uh, you know, felled in the bush, hauling it out, and uh, getting it ready for milling maybe took uh, a month or maybe six weeks. There was a local architect. He owns a big business down country. He came and volunteered to go out and uh, make plans. We'd uh, cut the timbers for the second floor and get them fitted, and then we'd cut the, the flooring itself. It was inch and a half planking again, uh, hemlock planking. And we'd push it up the hole, uh, up the ladder, and they'd uh, nail it in. As soon as we got that finished, then of course we were able to go up and finish the roof rasters. But it was surprising, you know, how much you could get done in a weekend if you had six or eight people out there working. Some cutting, some pushing it up, some nailing, some measuring to find out what the, the next length had to be so that we'd hit the joists properly. It was, uh, it was a very cooperative effort by all the six or seven people over there. The local boat club, the yacht club in town here, uh, had, a, had a little barge. Actually, it was a, a raft about 10 feet long, and 8 feet wide. And uh, we loaded it up with a ton of material every time we went out. And uh, hauled it behind uh, one boat or another, got it to the island, and, and then threw it in the water, <laughs> floated it ashore, and uh, hauled it up in the beach and then took it up and uh, made sure it wasn't going to warp by putting slats between it so it would stay the winter then. But really, the timber came second because we had to get a stonemason to complete the stonework first. And actually we worked at the same time almost because he would finish one section of the stonework, we'd put the first floor in, then he'd use that first floor to continue up and as soon as he got the second floor in and the stonework completed all the way around the parapet and so on, then, then we could put the roof on. <laughs> we couldn't run electric cord that far, so we had to use a generator. And the generator uh, was uh, donated by, by a local builder, Ron Seaman, a Seaman Builders. And that thing <laughs> worked for three years for us out there. The stone that we got uh, was dolomite from the peninsula and uh, was brought down in big trucks and it was uh, put on the shore uh, and it was slung onto a barge that, that was uh, Willie LeBonce's barge and he hauled it out to the island for, for us and with, with a big machine brought it up to the site. Now now and again, <laughs> as you know, stone doesn't cut exactly the way you want it and a few of them were missing. Well. We weren't going to get Willie to bring uh, three pieces of dolomite out there, no matter what size they were. So we took them out in these rafts <laughs> and manhandled them onto our little 12-inch dock and got them up to the site somehow. Some of them were 700 pounds. Well, we've done the first environmental cleanup ever. That includes federal, local government, 
uh, environmentalists, bird watchers, everybody has kind of said, well, gee, it's bad over there. It needs cleaning up. So three years ago when we started, almost every bird nest over here had a hunk of plastic in. Last year, very few did. It's not anybody's fault, it's just modern society. Flotsam comes up on the beach and birds use it. We've taken tons of, uh, of material off here, not just um, plastic, but lead acid batteries that were used uh, to power the light after it was electrified. That's uh, 22,000 hours ago and three years, and we've employed 250 volunteers, and we have about 350 vo uh, donors now. And then to, to discover that people really cared about it, and they went out there, and they, they worked, and they raised money, and they did all sorts of absolutely amazing things to restore this lighthouse. And, and you could see everybody pitching in, and, and I mean, Aside from actually the, the restoration, which is, you know, wonderful in itself, I think the thing is that people cared about that lighthouse. And it, just as I was saying earlier, you know, roots are very important, and that lighthouse surely is, is, has a lot of roots for a lot of people. And, and to me, that's just so immensely satisfying that, that people care for it. And now you go out and there's landscaping all around, there's no junk and debris, there's a, it, do, it isn't the slate roof, but it looks like a slate roof. The inside is just so wonderful, everything's clean and painted and, and uh, I'm absolutely thrilled. I guess I, I wanted to leave something that was uh, mine and that, that I'd worked on. For me, uh, the pioneers in the community, the builders and the fishermen and all that were, it made this town what it is. And without the light out there, and of course the lighthouse keeper, the boats and the ships and the sailing craft couldn't have come into our harbor and Salatin would never have grown. I was always amazed at the number of people that would show up at the dock, sometimes 15 at a time, and want to go out and do something with us. And it was, it was marvelous. Photographers, you know, uh, people that wanted to do work uh, in the gardens, people that wanted to uh, plant trees, and people that wanted to help build a dock. And uh, all, all these people brought their talents with them. I'll tell you, the volunteers have been just wonderful. Let me tell you a short story about a typical volunteer. This woman is over 70. She uh, was she was a lifeguard getting herself through university years ago and she would row the last lighthouse keeper out here when he went to shore for supplies and had a, a, a little too much rum. She uh, had heart trouble and this year was, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. So in order to have the, the cancer operated on, she had to have um, the heart operated on. Between those two operations, she got all this furniture. There was about an eight-week period, and she got people in Bruce County to donate this furniture and the museum to kick in some. Um, she had the cancer operation. Her first radiation treatment was on uh, uh, like the 7th of August, and we were to scheduled to open on the 11th. She came over the next day and arranged all the furniture. And the thing I remember most was when she was all through that day, she slept on that little, in the parlor, she fell asleep in that little, that little couch that she got there. And the, that typifies the spirit of the volunteers. What a terrific woman and what a terrific group of volunteers. It's nice to think, really, that uh, you have something you could leave behind for the next generation and that uh, we were here to do it. So for me, we all have families. We have children and grandchildren and that. Then we have a kind of a wider scope that's uh, in a way selfish. We want to leave something that's dis discernible to say we were here, we're human beings, and you should pay attention to this because it's important to go on in the future. Uh, everybody has a part of themselves in this project. Every volunteer has a part of themselves now. I was just delighted and amazed. I couldn't believe how much they had done in the restoration when uh, when we were out uh, there. 
everywhere I turned I could see something and as I walked through the house I did wonder about these three young men who were staying at uh, the keeper's house with uh, Grandpa Lambert and and his wife and and so on. How the proprieties could be kept, and I know they uh, they were. It wasn't a very big house, and I don't know where they all slept. It uh, kind of conjured up all kinds of images. When we were there, it was it was an it was a empty ghost of the past. It it, it was un uncared for and. I didn't, I didn't sense them there. Uh, and so now I sense them there, and I think that's really interesting. Uh, I don't know what all those Lamberts, now long gone, did for all those years, but I have the feeling they're back there now because the place has been made ready for them. I can see them sitting in that, uh, around the fireplace, talking, maybe a a mariner from some other port is in and he's sitting there too and yeah, spinning tales and singing the old songs. Oh yeah, they're there. After decades of being lost and forgotten, our spirits have been awakened to the glow beaming from the lighthouse tower, just like an old familiar smile. Uh, the toil of many a hard worker has created this place 150 years past, and such is the work that has now brought our home back to life. Our spirits have been rejuvenated by this display of dedication, commitment, and passion. Oh, the strength of the human spirit is a relentless, timeless power. Yet to come. 